and give a great round of applause to Sebastian Eschweiler. <laughs> So hi everyone, um, so um, I want to talk about uh, how I defeated NotPetya's uh, cryptography. Um, some might say um, that NotPetya would be um, Ukraine's scourge and for those of you who don't know uh, what the word scourge means, um, this guy right here doesn't know either and um, quick trivia quiz. Um, does anyone know uh, what this movie is? What's the name of the movie? So, in the next scene, Johnny Depp enters. Um, does it ring a bell? Jim, um, uh, a movie by Jim Jarmusch, uh, soundtrack by Neil Young. Dead Man, right, great. <laughs> so, great movie. So, if you want to know what uh, a scourge is, um, then you could watch the movie. So let's begin with my, with, with my talk. So um, this is what actually um, the official Ukraine Twitter account tweeted some time ago in uh, the end of uh, June 2017. Um, and there was an outbreak of a ransomware attack uh, which was uh, noticed mostly in Ukraine but um, also all over the world. So millions of users and also companies, large companies were um, affected and the damage went into the billions of dollars. So, um, the, the problem there is, I mean, this is, this is not the everyday um, ransomware outbreak uh, you will have there. And I want to give you um, a short glimpse into the, the NotPetya universe um, and also how I could decrypt all these stuff um, that yeah, actually was encrypted by um, the, this uh, ransomware outbreak. Um, so first I want to begin my talk with a differentiation. Um, I want to draw a demarcation line because all this NotPetya universe, um, there's much sub-summarized under, under this whole label and I really, um, I'm just talking about a small fraction of um, this whole universe. Um, so I, I will um, first distinguish between what my talk will be and what my talk will not be about. Um, next, I will um, describe NotPetya's cryptography and especially um, NotPetya's uh, cryptographic failures, uh, which I then will be um, exploiting in the remainder of the talk and see um, how can uh, the users get their um, yeah, um, vacation photos back. So. What was this, this whole thing? Um, the outbreak um, started, as I said, um, in June 2017, and um, it started as a um, fake update or as a um, malicious update from um, a software called Medoc. Um, this is a text software, one of the two official text softwares in the Ukraine, so um, almost every company has it installed on tax accounts, on, on their computers. Uh, many private persons uh, have it installed. Um, it was um, pushed and then yeah, side-loaded. Um, this file proceed that um, was then um, downloaded to the computers and it comprises several parts. Um, and some parts are more interesting than, than others. Um, so, um, one component after um, like half an hour time, um, it would start encrypting the files depending on the um, access level. So if there wasn't any um, access to infect the um, computer with um, well this MBR infector, um, then it would just, um, based on the current user level, um, encrypt the files based on that current user. In lack of a better name, I would call this um, Misha component. Um, I know it's usually somewhat different, uh, something different. Um, however, um, this was the best name I, I could find there. So it's basically just a file encryptor with AES. My talk will not go about um, this, um, this part, this file infector. 
Um, the next very uh, interesting uh, component was the spreader part. Um, it's basically um, based on the eternal blue, eternal romance uh, exploit um, that had been leaked by um, the shadow brokers. Uh, my talk will not go about this as well. Um, this is a whole different universe as well. Um, what my talk will be about is um, the actual NotPetya component. And this is an MBR encryptor, and um, I will um, show you in the next slide what it's actually about. So, um, the user will see something like this um, upon reboot. Um, so, if the, the um, access rights are granted, so if there is uh, some local admin installed on the computer or um, the um, correct password could be guessed by some attack, um, then this um, the dropper, the perf seed that would infect the um, system by overwriting the master boot record um, with a custom bootloader. And it would um, reboot the system after a predefined time, usually being about 10 minutes. And then um, the the actual NotPetya component would kick into action. Um, this infected MBR, um, this bootloader, um, shows this decoy um, check disk screen, um, and in the background would um, find and iterate um, the old files on the file system and encrypt all these files. So the, the main takeaways of this slide are um, that we are dealing with 16-bit code here. So we're, we're in 16-bit uh, real mode. So um, this means no proper file system. It means no 32-bit or 64-bit code. Um, there are no Windows APIs. So debugging all this and um, analyzing this is a tedious work. Um, However, we have something um, on the plus side, uh, which is a BIOS, you know, um, the basic input-output system. And um, with that comes a range of interrupts um, that are very well described. Um, and a really nice thing is um, having box and being able to um, yeah, debug all this in... Um, in IDA. So um, this was a really neat plugin that uh, had been developed by the um, authors. So let's analyze a bit and check the um, cryptography and why implementing crypto is um, really hard. Um, so I, I will start this part with um, describing in short words um, the theory of Salsa 20 um, and then check that, compare that against um, the NotPetya implementation of uh, this cipher. So, Salsa 20 is a um, stream cipher. Um, so, basically, um, you will have a um, plain text. Um, it's, it's about here, and, and then you will have some kind of um, yeah, random number generator or pseudo-random number generator, um, and then apply some operations on the plain text, and out comes the cipher text. Um, and what you put in there um, are four different variables, um, or four, four different inputs, um, because uh, there is the constant part, which is obviously not variable, um, but we will see about that in a bit. Um, so. You, you have um, these uh, key and the nonce. Um, and then there's this really nifty thing um, called counter. Um, what's so nifty about that is um, if you were to, uh, to stream a um, Salsa 20 encrypted stream and you would lose some frames, um, then you could um, adjust this uh, counter variable, which would um, demark the um, offset of the current um, stream, in, in the current stream, and then could continue needlessly um, with, with the decryption of the stream. So this is a very nice feature. Um, the size of the counter is um, 64 bits, and um, the um, hash size here, so um, what Salsa is, uh, does is uh, create a 64-byte um, hash for um, every uh, different of these inputs. Um, and would that then apply to the input? Um, if you want any more details about this uh, Salsa cipher, um, the inventor of Salsa should be in this room and should be in, uh, at the convention or 
he is at the convention. Uh, I just rode the train with him. Um, so I guess you can ask him the, the gory details um, of uh, Salsa 20. So it's a really nice um, crypto cipher and you should hit him up and ask him. I shouldn't have said that, right? Sorry. <laughs> so um, basically what um, a very important thing is uh, to note is for every invocation of this, um, this or for every instance of um, uh, the, a NotPetya um, encryption, um, you would have these three, uh, these, uh, three variables or the, these three inputs um, being constant. So um, NotPetya would, would patch during the infection process um, the key, the nonce, and the constants um, into a, a configuration uh, sector. Uh, the constants, not um, these. These are somewhat different. Um, and then the counter would only change throughout every uh, iteration. So the interesting thing, or the inter interesting question, was um, first: What is the um, length of um, the, the key stream? So the key stream, you know, the the number of um, different outputs that that would come um, out of of this hashing function. And I mean, for um, this implementation or the, this for the theory, um, this is quite clear. It's um, 64 bits here, eight bytes um, times um, the 64 bytes of output, so it would be about 2 to the 70 um, of a per periodicity. Um, one difference um, about the actual implementation in uh, NotPetya and the theory um, would be that um, this constants um, thing here had been changed to um, a string uh, reading out um, invalid sect ID. So this would break the um, official implementation. So the very first um, failure I saw at NotPetya um, was something like this. Um, so I think I can skip to this slide because it's obvious for everyone that this is a fail, right? So who, who sees the fail? So not many hands. Okay, then, then I'll explain it. Um, so um, I was just kidding. So I'm, I was not, not expecting uh, for, for you to, to grasp that at first. So um, remember, we're in 16-bit code. Um, we have uh, here this uh, shift left operation, which would um, shift a register by n bytes. The register width here is 16 bits, so it only has 16 digits, uh, so to speak, and you would uh, shift it by 16, by 10 hex, 16. And this would effectively null the register. And even worse, um, is here, so um, you would shift a, an, an 8-bit register for um, 16, so this is something you, you wouldn't expect from a proper um, cryptographic implementation. Um, and I was, was really intrigued why that is, because uh, it wouldn't make any sense in source code, and, and did the not Petya or the Petya authors um, really implement that on purpose, or what, what was the, the gist with it? And I looked up the um, uh, NotPetya, uh, the, the Salsa 20 implementation. Um, I just Googled it and found a nice um, website that um, had a um, implementation of uh, Salsa 20. And um, there you would see this code. So um, you see here, um, it's, it's in the, the Andianus conversion. And you see here um, these, these shifting of um, bits of registers, and you see here this, this uh, uint fast 16 or 32 um, type. Um, so it becomes quite clear that um, this is a broken implementation, right? So everyone can see that, right? No, not right now, um, because you need to know some things more about this. Um, there are two important facts um, that make this implementation broken. And the two facts are you need to compile this code for 16 bits um, and you need to look up um, what Visual Studio makes of um, these, these uh, type definitions here. And when you look that up, um, this um, is from Visual Studio and it's in the standard int.h uh, um, header file. And there you see it's interpreted or translated as unsigned int. So this is the base type. And this base type, unsigned int, in 16-bit code is a 16-bit variable or a 16-bit register. And then everything makes sense. 
and this was somewhat of a of a failure um, here. Um, the authors didn't really check if their code was actually working against the test vectors. Um, and this guy who wrote the code here, um, this Salsa 20 implementation, uh, made this mistake um, also. Um, on this slide, you see two bugs of, um, of the NotPetya implementation of um, Salsa 20. Um, and I quickly want to, to explain both to you because they are of uh, some, somewhat importance uh, throughout the remainder of the talk. Um, so, both revolve around the, the counter variable. Uh, just remember, um, this counter variable is the only dynamic input, the only variable input throughout all these um, Salsa 20 invocations. And the, the first error is, um, so you read a um, sector, a sector number, into um, the memory. So a bit about the, um, the low-level aspects of a hard drive. Um, a hard drive from the view of um, the BIOS would look somewhat like um, a bunch of different sectors. So these are 512-byte chunks of data. Um, and they, they come one after another. So if you were to read a sector, you would actually read a 512-byte uh, uh, long per, uh, portion of data. Um, and this is obviously not the offset in the stream. And this is somewhat of a problem there. So um, you see here the same variable is used to um, decrypt or encrypt the data. And I mean, this, this is, um, it, doesn't, it isn't really apparent to, um, to the uh, implementer of, of this um, cipher. Um, However, um, if you were to analyze it, um, it would look something like this. So you would have the um, key stream um, of two different sectors, two different consecutive sectors here. So it would start with, with FF and then continues with D7 and so on. Um, and the next sector would have almost all of the bytes identical. And this is um, yeah, a really big failure because um, this really nice Salsa 20 implementation, uh, the, this really nice Salsa algorithm, would then be, um, yeah, from would then be yeah, uh, converted from a one-time pad to a many times pad, and um, this is the first file I wanted to show you in these very few lines of code. The second part is um, the second bug is here um, this large keyword. Remember. We are in 16-bit code, so um, this large keyword here does not push a 64-bit variable as uh, we would suspect to do it, but a 32-bit variable. So only 32 bits of um, this, this uh, nice counter variable are actually used in this case. So these two failures are somewhat of a problem for um, this um, Salsa 20 implementation. So, in this slide, I um, took two um, different hex dumps, and um, these hex dumps were uh, are um, within this uh, expand key uh, function, um, and they they are well basically two snapshots: one um, right before um, these bugs become apparent, so before this this um, endianness conversion, and right after on uh, the lower half. Um, so you um, very nicely see um, the the different variables being put into or the different key inputs being um, put into um, these, uh, this memory block. So here it will spell out invalid sect ID, you know, the constants uh, not Petya uses. Um, here you would see the key and um, here, so it's broken into two halves. Um, additionally, you would see the nonce here. Um, and what really sticks out is this bunch of the zeros here. So um, this, um, this higher part of this um, a 64-bit variable isn't even used. It's, uh, it's not even filled there. So um, this is, well, um, the first problem here. And after the endianness conversion, you see um, that 
it's not really an endianness conversion, but it's more of a nulling of, um, uh, of bytes. So the result would be that um, this initially 64-bit variable would be just 16-bit in length. And as I said earlier, um, the original source implementation would be 2 to the 70 um, as, as key length. Um, and right now we have um, 16 bits uh, times 64 bytes in, in key length, uh, which would result then in uh, 26 bits in key length, uh, which would be a measly uh, 4 megabytes in key length. So um, this, is, th this was a very interesting observation uh, I made there, and um, this would be possible then um, to uh, decrypt W together with the um, many times pad um, properties of uh, this cipher, um, which make it really easy to break. So to quickly summarize um, this part of the talk, um, so we have a very, very short key stream of um, just four megabytes. Um, it's highly rep uh, repetitive. Um, so for each sector you progress, um, you would only have a progress of one byte um, at a time. Um, so only 26 bits remain of um, the whole stream. Um, and as I said, the, the, the many times pad um, properties, a very nice thing to, um, to analyze. Um, I couldn't come around to um, implement a small joke here, so um, this, this salsa implementation I would only call uh, lalsa from now on. Um, Sorry, it's a bad joke, sorry. So the, the main goal is um, to derive the key stream. Um, and as I'm not really a crypto expert, um, the, basically the, the only attack I know would be a known plaintext attack. So um, this was my goal there because it's so straightforward to do that. Um, and in the remainder of the talk, I will um, tell you how I did that. So, without further ado, let's uh, exploit these failures um, and see how much of the um, plaintext we can uh, actually get from uh, a NotPetya infected drive. Um, so, the modus operandi of uh, NotPetya would look somewhat like that. Uh, this, this, uh, so, uh, let's let's stop with the with the left hand side of the uh, of the slide and concentrate on the right hand side. Um, for those of you who who are not really intimately uh, familiar with uh, NTFS. Uh, I wasn't before analyzing Petya uh, or not Petya um, as well, so no worries. It's, it's quite simple. So every uh, NTFS partition has something uh, called a master file table, uh, MFT uh, abbreviated. And um, it would um, contain some metadata about the file, for example, the file name, the um, file size. Um, and if the file is small enough, um, it would even fit the um, actual content of the file into this uh, record. So, um, as I said, MFT is just list of records. Um, and if the file is larger, um, it would um, have a pointer, a uh, so-called data run, uh, which would point um, to a cluster or a sector uh, on the disk, on the partition, um, which would then um, actually be the, the payload data. Um, one of these MFT records um, is one kilobyte in size. So now to um, the actual implementation. So uh, let's zoom out a bit um, and see how this LALSA implementation um, is used uh, in NotPetya. Um, so it would basically just iterate over, uh, over all of these MFT records and then um, check if this record would Put into uh, would point uh, to a file. If that is the case, it would um, encrypt the first kilobyte of the file, and then would encrypt the uh, record itself. Um, this implementation is um, good for um, a bunch of reasons. Um, it's very fast. Uh, you would only need to um, encrypt the first kilobyte, and this this first kilobyte uh, contains really, really important information. Um, and uh, for example, header, uh, headers, or um, um, especially um, compressed files um, have these 
really important header structures there. Um, additionally, file recovery tools wouldn't be able to um, work anymore because most of them rely on this very header. And um, the second thing is this MFT um, is, um, can be considered as table of contents. So w with no metadata, with, with no pointers uh, to, these, to the files, um, you won't have anything there to work with, to recover from. Um, and this is um, a... I mean, from, from the implementation standpoint, it's uh, very neat because it's fast and it's um, yeah, th somewhat um, thorough. Um, as the uh, MFT is really um, important, um, my idea was to, to recover that first and then check what, um, what comes out from there and see um, how I can, can further progress there with uh, the decryption of the files. So the metadata um, would, would be of most importance there. Um, I'm a visual person, and um, here I took two um, uh, disk dumps um, from, a, um, from one of my test disks. Um, so I infected a clean system with uh, NotPetya and let it encrypt the hard drive. And on the left-hand side, you see um, the plain text. Uh, on the, and on the right-hand side, you see um, the encrypted um, data. So. Um, to just get uh, a better picture about the encryption process. On the far left uh, hand side, fancy PowerPoint, um, what's it, animation, um, you see um, some kind of indicator, um, so which, which would um, tell you at which offset um, how much of the, of the data is actually um, being different. And you see um, the whole disk is more or less being encrypted. Mm. However, you see um, at the far bottom part here, um, it's more dark red. And this is actually the MFT. So um, the MFT is um, towards the end of the disk sometimes. Um, but this might be a misconception. So the, my, my idea was something like this. Um, we have two input sizes, right? We have the, the encrypted MFT and we have encrypted files. And um, first I would um, analyze um, the MFT and then derive the key stream from that. Um, after um, th that analysis stage had been finished, I would um, put the uh, key stream back into the, um, this, this um, little box here and uh, actually decrypt that. Um, and then out comes the um, decrypted MFT. And with that and the key stream, I would be able to find the encrypted files on the disk and then be able to um, decrypt them and then be ready with it, right? So th this was my, my uh, initial idea there. And um, so um, let's start with the decryption of the MFT. No plain text attack, right? Um, so an MFT looks for, from, from the viewpoint of the, the key stream, somewhat like this. So you would have here um, the first, the second, and so on um, MFT records. And on the, on the column, you would have the um, actual byte that is used um, as key to encrypt the key stream. Uh, remember, the um, operation um, that... Um, that encrypts the, you know, the, the key stream and the, um, the plain text um, is just a mere XOR operation. So you have the, the key stream and the plain text, um, and it's plainly um, so you, you can switch forth and back between um, plain text and cipher text, and even the key stream with, a, with just applying an XOR operation. Um, so what you see here is um, for the very first records, um, you only have very few keystream um, bytes or very few sample bytes. However, as, um, the as you make progress with the analysis, um, then you will have more and more of these um, sample bytes to um, collect from, and um, this, this will give you more confidence in the, um, in the result, in the um, maybe known keystream then. Um, the question is, uh, does the MFT hold enough um, plaintext to do some, some kind of uh, known plaintext attack? So let's look into the specification. 
Um, the MFT record has basically two um, fields. So um, there is this, this standard information, uh, which is a well-defined structure. And there's something else called attribute list, uh, which is a quite dynamic structure. Um, and this would be a somewhat more different, uh, difficult to um, glean um, plain text from. So I concentrated on this um, first part, and uh, the first part quickly turned out to be um, quite constant for, um, yeah, for many or most of um, um, the MFT records. Um, and you see it, it starts with file and then has uh, some, some hex digits after that. Um, and on the, on the far bottom um, part of the slide, I um, added my yeah, certainty level. So the, the certainty level would be the number of different um, sample bytes I would have um, multiplied by yeah, the confidence I would have in that uh, sample byte being actually this, um, this plain text. So you see, for the very first record, um, it would have a quite low, f uh, the, uh, low certainty. I mean, it, it's just one byte, right? Um, oh, uh, the two-byte skipping um, is, I mean, quite straightforward, uh, considering you would have usually 512 bytes per sector on a disk, and the um, MFT record is one kilobyte in size. So um, the stream would progress two bytes. Um, and for record 100, so for, for the uh, 100th record, I would have a certainty um, of 4, uh, because, you know, I would just assume these 8 plain text bytes here um, divided by 2 would then result into 4. Um, this wasn't really satisfactory. Um, the problem there was towards the end, um, I would have many, many um, unknown records, um, because I would was concentrating on, on the very first parts of um, the header. Um, so the remainder of the key stream, uh, the very end of the key stream, um, wasn't be able to being analyzed and uh, eventually decrypted. So I thought of something different. Um, and that was uh, something like a, I would call a byte histogram. So for every offset um, of the MFT record, I would... Um, I would then um, yeah, calculate, um, create an, an, a histogram um, and check how many different bytes are there actually for plaintext. You know, it's a plaintext, non plaintext attack. Um, so I would need some kind of plaintext there. I would do that for every offset, for every um, um, uh, record. And so the, the question is there how to get many MFT records. It's quite easy. Um, if you have um, some nice colleagues, you just need to hang them over the balcony and shake them a bit, then more or less voluntarily they uh, will give you some MFTs to work with. Um, and the result of that is um, quite nice. You, um, I mean, for, for the very first, um, there's n nothing much you can do. Um, the very first record will always have uh, very few sample bytes. But as uh, the stream progresses, um, you will have a dramatic change there. So from this uh, relatively low certainty of 4, um, I could increase that to um, more than 30. Um, so this is um, somewhat nice. And after a bit of uh, doing science, um, this table um, drops out from nowhere. Um, so I compared these two um, attack types. So um, let's read that from, from right to left. Um, on, the, on the far right, I have, um, for the first approach, um, about 98% of um, the MFT records um, being successfully recovered. You know, with, with uh, the, the good thing with science and with all this um, academic approach um, is you have a ground truth. So I have a plain text, an unencrypted hard drive, virtually, uh, virtually um, unaltered from something um, right after infection, and then you let uh, execute the, the whole infection and encryption process. And then you can differentiate and, and take you know, s several snapshots throughout the infection, um, change uh, different key uh, values and all this stuff. So th this is a very nice thing about this um, academic approach um, I was taking uh, there. Um, so I could, I could 
exactly pinpoint how many um, of these records were um, perfectly um, recovered. Um, so for the byte histogram approach, I could um, decrypt almost all of the records, which is quite nice because then we have a high quality MFT to work with. What's also quite nice is um, that we have zero um, wrong key stream bytes. What's not so nice, however, is um, that I was only able to um, recover about 1.3% um, of the overall key stream. And um, remember, this, this key stream is about um, 4 megabytes in length, and I was able to recover only 50 kilobytes uh, of that, so we cannot recover all of the, the files. Or is that so? This, is, um, this was my next question there, and um, so I draw another nice diagram. Um, this is the key stream in the, uh, the, this is the MFT, sorry, in the key stream. So um, the, the um, key stream is only filled in, in sample bytes um, at this uh, two megabytes mark. And the question is, um, are there many files in this area being encrypted, or is there some other bug I could exploit? And I um, checked where the files would lie into this, the key stream. Um, so I would check how many files um, are at which location in the key stream being encrypted. Um, and you see um, the key stream is used all over the place. So, I mean, sometimes it's uh, used more, sometimes it's used, used less. However, um, it's basically used all over the place. And so th this much of the key stream could in a perfect scenario be, um, I mean, perfect scenario being a perfect known plain text oracle um, could theoretically be recovered. Um, however, um, this is somewhat of a problem here. And in the next part of the um, talk, I will present you how I was able to solve this problem as well. So um, remember when the um, file system is actually um, uh, encrypted by NotPetya, um, the file system looks somewhat like this. So you would have the MFT, which is totally garbled. Um, so you won't have any, any nice file pointers pointing or data runs pointing um, to those files. Uh, you won't have any um, nice file names and all the stuff. Um, but with the first stage being finished, um, the MFT looks really nice. I mean, like uh, almost 100% of the um, f records could be recovered. So uh, it looks somewhat like this. So you have a bunch of metadata um, you can now use to analyze um, the, the remainder of the files and the remainder of the encryption. So all this MFT, or almost all, is um, actually decrypted. Um, and for files, you would have um, the very first kilobyte being encrypted. Um, the remainder of the file, the, the, um, I mean, most files are more than a kilobyte in size, right? So um, all the rest is not encrypted. So you would have all this, this data and metadata um, to collect information and uh, to, to use to exploit um, as known plaintext, as, as indicators for known plaintext. Um, so I thought of three different approaches to um, um, yeah, to, to um, attack this problem. Um, basically, I, I was thinking about, okay, w what different files are there? And I was quickly thinking about different file types. And I mean, there, there are... Um, I mean, the, the file type can be easily gleaned from this, right? Because uh, you um, would have the, the file extension, and that would be basically um, the file type. Um, and you would have two different types of files. You would have structured files and unstructured files. So um, I thought of these, and you would have something like um, yeah, um, source code, which I would consider as more or less uh, unstructured. And I was calculating the histogram. Um, so this would give me some kind of prevalence towards different bytes in the key stream. So it would be somewhat like a guest plain text attack or something like that. Um, the next thing for um, structured files 
would be um, to do the very same approach um, as with the MFT records. I would um, calculate the histogram for every um, offset of the first kilobyte um, and then um, quickly see how, how many different bytes are there per offset. And the last approach um, uses somewhat more um, data. It um, uses some of the metadata and also some of the file data. Um, I will go into this um, right now. Um, so, what I basically have here, um, as I said, it's um, only this, this little portion of the file is encrypted. Um, the whole remainder of the file is not encrypted, which is quite nice. Um, and also the file name, the file size is not encrypted. So, what I, use, uh, what, what I would do here is um, create a database of known files, of known uh, Windows system files, for example. Um, you all uh, re might remember um, these nice background images, fonts, all this stuff. Um, plain text is um, flying around everywhere uh, if you just look for it. And I would have um, basically three different um, uh, yeah, three three different uh, distingu uh, d uh, distinctors um, between those um, to know which which is the correct plain text. So um, there is this this key file name, the file size, and then the hash of um, this this whole remainder, this whole tail. So um, if all these three uh, tuple would match. Then I would consider um, this as a well, proper plain text. Um, however, there are some collisions, um, so uh, this is this is not really um, something that is straightforward. So um, the initial idea of having uh, of, of only needing to um, analyze the uh, MFT and then. Uh, could st uh, being being able to uh, straightforward uh, decrypt files uh, needed to be um, altered a bit. So I added this um, database of known files uh, there. I added another another um, analysis uh, stage uh, in this nice box here, um, and then I would be able to um, decrypt the files um, eventually. So let's do a bit of science and check um, if this approach would be worthwhile pursuing on a real-world scenario. So let the science cat do its science. Let me have a drink. So what I basically um, did do here is uh, to create a database of known files. Um, I collected a bunch of um, default Windows installations. Um, which resulted in uh, about 340,000 uh, unique files in it. Um, then I calculated, you know, the, the different file type histograms I talked about. Um, I prepared my test setup. Um, I added there 1,000 different files. Um, and you, you should note that these files were not part of uh, this uh, known files database. Um, they um, were different from that because otherwise it would have been easy to do. Um, then I would infect this machine and then um, yeah, let it uh, encrypt by NotPetya and then um, attempt the recovery. And these are the results there. So um, I did this with uh, four different runs. So I um, tried every approach um, separately and then combined the three approaches. And the outcome was something like this. So I would have um, only two files by the general histogram approach um, being able to, be, uh, to, to decrypt. Um, at least 8% um, were, able, uh, were yeah, decrypted by the location histogram approach. Um, and by the known files approach, um, over 90% of the files could be successfully recovered. Um, and even better, um, the combined outcome would be um, almost all files being able to um, decrypt. So, so much about academia. So, um, the problem there is um, if you apply this to the real world, um, you could get into more trouble there. Um, there was lots and lots of uh, more to think about. So um, there were, for example, um, non-default Windows installations with a whole 
history of updates. Um, so this might be really interesting from a forensics perspective. Um, moreover, there's lots of installed programs uh, to derive known plaintext from. Um, for example, .NET uh, yields a vast uh, source of known plaintext um, or JDK inst installations. Um, so especially the JDK would, would result in, in about tens of thousands of uh, different source code and HTML files. So this, is, this is really, was really quite nice. Um, the drawback there was um, so um, there was so much data to um, collect. Um, the first attempts um, failed miserably because of um, the sheer amount of RAM I was using, and this um, would um, would result in, in the admins uh, con uh, constantly giving me more more RAM in my VM. Uh, so I uh, would eventually. Uh, end up with, I think, 128 uh, gigabytes of uh, RAM in my, my test VM. Um, also, you have a much larger uh, master file table, you know, because of all these um, files that would need to be stored. Uh, so, to put that in, in, in comparison, um, so this nice working prototype, um, so this nice test setup, I mean, um, would have an MFT uh, of about 26 megabytes. And for real-world scenarios, you would have something like uh, at least 500 megabytes, um, and even um, an MFT could be even like a couple of gigabytes in size. So this means much more plain text. So for, for these really large MFTs, you could um, uh, quickly recover um, the whole key stream, the whole four megabytes, um, just by looking at the MFT. Um, and in summary, um, this means that uh, the decryption of NotPetya encrypted drives is possible. Um, so, for for the f the um, file systems, the drives I have looked at, um, it was really I mean after after um, um, having all these these first bugs um, um, out of the way. Um, I was able to um, decrypt and recover all the files there. So there's a good chance um, the um, vacation photos can be recovered as well. And this will conclude my talk. Um, so a quick summary, um, NotPetya has some severe cryptographic failures and flaws. Um, so I would only be able to call this LALSA and uh, not SALSA anymore. Um, it might be possible to, to further look into this, this um, you know, this expand key um, thing. It, it has a really, um, really a bunch of more cryptographic failures in it. I didn't look into that uh, deeper, but I know some of you guys are professors, and um, this might be a nice homework for um, your students to um, look at this NotPetya implementation. And, um, check out some, you know, more advanced um, cryptanalysis um, methods. And you should note that um, this whole, cr um, this, this whole NotPetya thing here I described, the, the whole cryptographic flaws there, are not just in NotPetya. Um, they are, um, you see the brackets there, there, they are in every, each and every version of uh, Petya. So um, all of the drives um, that you potentially have saved um, can be decrypted. Um, and so my last point is, um, if any of you or any of us um, falls victim to a ransomware, you really should keep the drives. You keep them untouched in a locker and wait for um, a talk like this, basically, and um, then um, hope that um, someone comes around and then uh, be able to decrypt the, the drives and then you will have your vacation photos back. So that's all, folks. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Now it's time for questions. Please queue up by the microphones. Microphone one, please. Yes. Hi. Well, thank you very much for sharing your findings uh, with us. Uh, I'm from Rotterdam, uh, the largest harbor in Europe, and as you might know, we were struck by Petya. Yes. Uh, two terminals went down for a couple of days, a couple hundred million euros of damage. Um, 
Your approach is quite theoretically, so now to practice. If you were there in this summer with these findings, would you have been able to help us and decrypt the files and get all the companies up and running again? Or is this too academic? No, it's a practical approach. Um, I mean, I work for CrowdStrike, and um, we had some occasions where we were able to help the customers. Um, so it's um, a, a very practical thing to do so. And I was uh, trying to, to insinuate this with, uh, you know, um, this, this slide here. So I, I was talking about the real world in this scenario. So um, I looked at about 50 different encrypted hard drives with a NotPetya, and I was able to decrypt all of them or most of them. Mostly um, the, the ones not being able to decrypt um, were to some, well, uh, let's say level eight mistakes. Awesome. Have you shared your findings with nomoransom.org too? No. I uh, don't know about this site. Oh, they provide decryption tools for ransomware. Ah, okay, okay. Please do. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone six, please. Uh, thank you. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that basically the key was shortened to, what was it, 24 bits, something like 26, that? 26, yes. 26. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, from that point, wasn't a brute force attack way faster oh, and no. way more reliable? Oh, no, no, no. Don't get me wrong there. So the key stream length was 2 to the 26. So the key stream length was 4 megabytes. So um, you, weren't a, uh, you wouldn't be able to brute force that. So, so uh, do you get that? So the, the number um, of bytes was four megabytes. And um, you couldn't be able to, to brute force that. Yeah, but you already mentioned at the beginning that you basically uh, shortened it down to the possibility of at most two to the power of 26. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I, I that get, is I get the question. calculable. Yes, yes, I, I totally get the question, but you're, you're um, um, missing the point there. So uh, it's not the key space, 2 to the 26, but the key length is 2 to the 26, which would be something I, I, I'm not good at, at uh, converting this to, to uh, decimal. Uh, would be something like, let me check, 2 to the, I mean, here, math guys, computer guys, 2 to the 26. How many bits is that? Say again? A lot. A lot. So it's, I mean, well, it's, some, it's four megabytes of, of key length. And, and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't just, um, just brute force that because you, you would have each of these four megabytes, you would have to brute force. Got that? So, so the, the, the key is not two to the 26, but the, the key length, the key stream length is that long. Got that? So uh, the, the, this, this, uh, the, the key space um, would be longer than the Bible, you know, and you couldn't just brute force the Bible, the text of the Bible. I mean, given enough time, yes, but, you know, we, we all know the stories with the monkeys and the typewriters. I mean, we, we can talk about that, that offline, but you're, you're mixing up two different numbers there. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Questions from the internet, please. Does the MFT encryption work the same for Petya and not Petya? Um, yes, the underlying mechanism is the same. The cryptography um, um, differs in such a way that the um, constants number uh, is different. So um, this little guy here, um, this is different. Um, it would be usually like expand key something something. Um, and here it's invalid sect ID. So it's somewhat different. Um, but the, the MFT encryption, I mean, the, the um, byte code the, um, and, and the algorithm is the very same. Thanks. Any more questions? Then uh, please give a great round of applause to Sebastian. Thank you.